Welcome everyone to the First United Methodist Church. We're so happy to see everyone. I know it's a little cold outside, so I'm happy your car started and you got here. Uh, <laughs> I was hoping that was my car got here, so I was very happy. Um, please stand and join us for our, uh, our song set this morning. journey I get lost in my mistakes what looks to be like weakness is a canvas for your strength my story isn't over my story's just begun failure won't define me cause that's what my father does failure won't define me cause that's what my father does your burdens down Ooh, here in the father's house check your shame at the door cause it ain't welcome anymore Ooh, you're in the father's end game the journey's where you are you never wanted perfect you just wanted my heart and the story isn't over the story isn't good failures never find oh when the father's in the room failures never find Prison doors swing wide, the dead come to life. Love is on the move when the Father's in the room. Miracles take place, the cynicals find faith. Love is breaking through when the Father's in the room. Jericho walls are quaking, strongholds now are shaking.
Morning. Welcome to First United Methodist Church on this Reformation Sunday when we take time to acknowledge the Protestant Reformation and the, the contributions of uh, Martin Luther. My name is Jeffrey Hall and I have the privilege of serving this congregation who believes all means all that whoever you are and wherever you may be on your journey of faith that you are loved by God and you are welcome here. We take a moment to welcome those watching online and pray that our time together in the presence of the risen Christ might provide all of the necessary strength and grace you need as you uh, follow Jesus. Um, I know that all of us come to this time with heavy hearts this morning. Um, you know, we have wars in the Middle East, Russia and Ukraine, and of course the mass shooting in Lewiston, Maine. And um, I believe Victoria, where? Oh, <laughs> hi Victoria. Um, Victoria went ahead and, and got two banners and they're for two churches, right? In two Methodist churches in Lewiston. And so what we're asking is please don't leave here today before uh, going to the social hall and they're uh, on the tables and, and signing those, all right? Um, so we'll look forward to just make your way down the hall and, and they'll be there for you. Please make sure to sign them, all right? We are also in the fifth week of our season of stewardship. If you have not already done so, please fill out an estimate of giving card. You can place it in the offering box, the offering plate, mail it to the church, or just drop it by the office. And next Sunday on All Saints Sunday, November 5th, all of the estimate of giving cards will be presented and we'll offer a blessing uh, uh, and a prayer. Uh, let's see. And each, each Sunday, as you know, we hear from folks about what this church means to them, and so we'll look forward to hearing uh, from Victoria here in just a few moments. And uh, we'll sing our hymn, the fifth verse of our hymn, All Are Welcome, uh, this morning as well in response to the offering. All right. A number of announcements, but we're going to begin with an announcement uh, from Jan. Good morning. Uh, as you know, we had our United Women in Faith annual bazaar Friday and Saturday, and um, we did very well for our first time doing a pie and ice cream social. But I'd like to start off by saying thank you. Thank you to all of you who toiled so hard. Um, it's a blessing to work together, but it's also a blessing to meet the community because uh, United Women in Faith stands for love and action. And I saw so many examples of love and action. Um, whether we were there to hear stories from people, I saw patience and kindness and generosity just abounding, and I would just like to thank you all. Uh, if you did bake a pie in a glass pan, go back to the kitchen. We didn't have the ability to wash them, but please pick them up. Today, any baked goods are half price, except we have nine whole pies, if you're thinking maybe freezing them. We have those for sale. And there's also crafts, and uh, we just brought joy to the community. and. I mean, I just don't know how to say thank you to everyone. The donated items were just top quality. Can't expect anything less from this congregation. So thank you very much. We'll see you at the rummage sale. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Jan. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to, um, it was just a beautiful spirit, first of all, um, the last few days, just all week, really, as all of you were making it uh, all happen, and um, just a lovely spirit. And so now I'm looking forward to uh, what I call the glorious rummage sale, <laughs> all right? Um, United Methodist class concludes today, 11.30 in the chapel. Next Sunday we'll receive, I think we're receiving four new members. 
uh, as well. And if you'd like to join the church uh, and be received as a new member, there's still time. Be sure to sign up uh, today in the narthex. Um, one of the things that I'm wanting to do is strengthen a couple of our committees, namely trustees and finance. And so if you are interested in, um, it's amazing how many of you do not make eye contact with me when you know where I'm going with this. <laughs> but if any of you are interested in serving on trustees or finance, please uh, be sure to contact me uh, as soon as possible, meaning right after worship today. <laughs> No, th these are two committees that just need some support. We want to sort of revitalize uh, them. And uh, we'll be looking in the years to come as well of, of strengthening and revitalizing some other committees as well. All right. Uh, next Sunday, November 5th, All Saints Day service will remember and give thanks for those in our congregation who have died over the past year and have made their sacred journey home. Additionally, if you have a family member who has died this past year and would like them to be listed in the back of the booklet in memoriam. Um, you have until, please email the needed information, it's there in your announcement page, to the office by 12 o'clock on Wednesday, okay? Art and Soul class, there's no class in November, but the next class will be December 4th, all right. Um, Advent Bible study. Cheryl and Cap Kaplan will lead a four-week Advent study uh, beginning Sunday, November 26th from 11.45 to 12.45 in the chapel. You'll need a copy of the study guide and the sessions will include videos. There's a sign-up sheet in the narthex and so uh, this is wonderful. Uh, Red Wagon is in the narthex as always. If you would like to put flowers on the altar on Sunday morning in memory or honor of someone, please contact Judy Dake or the church office. Of course, there are clipboards in the narthex to sign up for ushers, coffee hour, worship assistant, and daylight savings time ends next Sunday. So um, don't forget to turn your clocks back. You join me in prayer. Mighty fortress, everlasting one, God of life and love, we remember the many ways in which you have helped and saved us from generation to generation. Be with us this day as we listen for your word for us this time. Touch our hearts with your healing mercy. We ask this in the name and way of Jesus. Amen. I want to invite you to come to your feet and take a few minutes and pass God's peace. Greet one another this morning. I invite you to return to your seats. And uh, we'll welcome uh, Victoria to come and share with us.
what church means to me. Anytime I walk onto this sacred ground, I feel a sense of welcoming peace and love. It is home. I know I will be welcomed by old friends and in turn be able to welcome newcomers too. My church memories began when I was four or five years old at Hollywood Vine Methodist Church in Hollywood, California. A presentation was made for children because we had memorized the Lord's Prayer. It was a small plaque of approximately four by six inches, not very big, which at night when the lights were turned off glowed in the dark, showing images of Jesus with small children at his feet. During my junior high years, my family's membership changed to the large cathedral-style First Methodist Church of Hollywood. It was there I joined others of my age in MYF, Methodist Youth Fellowship. I'm sure some of you have been there too. Which created opportunities beyond Sunday school and Sunday church services. There were Sunday evening services and midweek youth services, plus games and social events in the gymnasium and there were weekend and week-long church camps in the summer. One summer, I attended camp in the mountains east of San Diego. On the last morning there, we were told to get up at 4 a.m. for a hike to the top of the ridge. At the top, one of the counselors, a Methodist minister, delivered the Sermon on the Mount as the sun slowly rose over the Salton Sea. All of these years later, I can see him and hear those words anytime I wish. These three things were the first of what church means to me. Fast forward to September 1967, when I arrived in Roseburg, Oregon, with a three by five card, little card, prepared by a woman who worked with my mom at the headquarters of California Arizona Conference of Methodist Church in Los Angeles. I'm sure you can see a theme here. She recently had moved from Roseburg to the, and this church. There were four short remarks on the card to help me acclimate to this lovely small town. Church, Methodist on Harvard. Dentist, Richard McDonald, a member of this church on Harvard. <laughs> Neighborhood which would seem most like home, Hughcrest. Doctor, Dr. Salt, whose office was across the street from the courthouse. It's a parking lot now. <laughs> the first three suggestions were perfect. By 1969, separated and later divorced with two little mouths to feed, this church and the original fish pantry helped us survive. The pantry was located in the East Hall between the chapel and the pastor's office. Mildred Gum, the church secretary, knew everything and everyone was, and was very kind to us. She and the Reverend Hillis Slaymaker gave me hope, prayed with me for better times to come. In 1972, my time here was interrupted by a six-year residency in Myrtle Creek. An old, sweet, small town church had the same welcoming feeling as this church. It became our new church home. Many older members took me and my children under their wings, including Leroy and Betty Hanna. Once back to Roseburg in this church, I was here to stay. Each and every time I enter, feelings of warmth, awe, and love fill me. However, it isn't about this beautiful structure or the lovely grounds. It is about all of you. Most of those earlier years, I never knew it would become the place where all means all, no matter what. Through business affiliations and personal conversations with many persons of different faiths or no faith, I became quite aware of other places of worship who do not necessarily share these same truths. It saddens me for those who may be turned away from other congregations by not fitting their standards and then perhaps turned off from Christianity. I'm delighted to be part of our open hearts, open doors, and open minds. What does church mean to me as I go about my daily life? 
is about remembering Jesus' teachings, trying to do my best to apply and be faithful to them. Certainly I have failed and lost my way many times and imagine I may do so again. However, I know I will be forgiven and will always find my way back to my church home. This is my home. Beautiful. Beautiful. You know, I'm going to apologize ahead of time for my clumsy sermon compared to what we just heard. <laughs> that was just very well said. Thank you. And heartfelt, too. I could feel it. Thank you for that, Victoria. Today, we invite everyone to write your name in the form in the Black Friendship Registry book located in your pew rack. Please leave the attendance sheet in the, the book as they will be collected Monday morning. And let me say, if this is your first time uh, with us this morning visiting, um, it's important to me to meet you and welcome you personally. I'll look forward to doing that at the conclusion of the service. I'll be at the center doors. If this is your first time, please don't leave without giving me the opportunity to meet you and, w and welcome you. It's important to me. This morning's scripture reading is from Psalms 90, 1 through 6, and 13 through 17. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn us back to dust and say, turn back, mortals. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past, or like a watch in the night. You sweep them away, they are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed, in the evening it fades and withers. Turn, O Lord, how long? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, so that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad as many days as you have afflicted us, and as many years as we have seen evil. Let your work be manifest to your servants, and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us, and prosper us for the work of our hands. Oh, prosper the work of our hands. Some prayers to share this morning. Continues prayers for um, healing and hope for all those affected in the, the mass shootings in uh, Maine. All right. Lord, in your love, hear our prayers. This prayer came to us online, um, thank you Connie, um, from Anita Robertson. Continued prayers for uh, niece Kayla, who is in the fourth year of metastatic breast cancer and currently, it looks like feuding with her mom, my late husband's sister, all right. Lord, in your love. Okay. Prayer offered by Jennifer. Lord, please help us stop the killing in Israel, Palestine. Please stop all wars and bring us peace. Lord, in your love. This is a prayer offered by Bill uh, Lapp. Uh, prayers for, is it Joe? Bill, where are you? It's Joe, okay. Joe Lapp has been cleared of all cancer. Lord, in your love. Hear our prayers. All right. Hear our prayers, O God. In a world blinded by violence, grant us grace to fearlessly contend against evil, that we might reverently use our freedom for peace and justice. Let us remember Jesus, who believed in people and never despaired of them, who through all disappointment never lost heart, who disregarded his own comfort and convenient, 
and thought first of the needs of others, who was kind and compassionate in the midst of his own suffering and never threatened retaliation. Give us eyes to see the lonely and the lost, ears to hear your saving truth for the world, and tongues to speak your good news of steadfast love, hands to help those who suffer in body and mind, those in danger or distress. May those who grieve be comforted, and those who are passing through the valley of the shadow of death, may they find eternal rest. Amen. Inspired by the witness of Martin Luther and those who have gone before us, grateful for the opportunities that lie before us now, let us bring our tithes and offerings. Let us offer our financial contributions as both an act of worship and an expression of our gratitude. The ushers come forward, please, to receive this morning's tithes and offerings.
Let your favor, O God, our mighty fortress, be upon these gifts that your work may prosper in the wider world, in this neighborhood, and in this church where all are welcome. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Should threaten to us. 
Isn't it a blessing to have them? A scripture reading from Matthew, chapter 22, verses 34 through 46. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, you shall love the God, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them this question. What do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. He said to them, then how is it that David by the spirit calls him Lord, saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David thus calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one was able to give him an answer, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. Thank you for that uh, reading, um, Nancy. And, um, thank you for the, the, the special music today. Um, that was the first hymn I learned as a very young boy. And I learned it because it was on TV. That When, when I was a uh, little boy, there was this cartoon, a kind of claymation cartoon with da David and Goliath. And they called him Davy. And they would play this hymn uh, when the cartoon came on. And so it was the first hymn I learned. And I asked if it was possible to have some version of it done today. And so thank you for that. Really, really meant a lot to me. And I know it did to others as well. <coughs> on October 31st, 1517, an Augustinian monk by the name of Martin Luther published his 95 Theses. Some say he nailed his 95 Theses, also known as the Disputation on the Power of Indulgences, on the doors of All Saints Church and other churches in Wittenberg, Germany. Others say he sent his theses to the Archbishop Bishop of Mainz. And still others argue he did both. Whatever the case, what Martin Luther wrote, as one good Lutheran put it, kindled a fire that is still burning today. How many of you have connections to the Lutheran Church? I know you're all good Methodists now, but yeah, a number of you do. Good. All right. So let's see. Um, yeah, still burning today. Indulgences, as I think many of you know, were certificates that the Catholic faithful could purchase for themselves and loved ones, living or deceased, uh, to reduce the punishment of sins and their time in purgatory. Luther was not the first to raise concerns over the indulgences. There were others before him, but Luther had the advantage others did not. Those of you who have been good students in my United Methodism class know what I'm thinking, what I've said. He had the advantage of the Gutenberg printing press. And so he was able to publish and make his writings known at an unprecedented scale. Luther and Protestants early on are recognized for three basic tenets, scripture alone. Number one, scripture, not tradition, not an institution, is the authority when it comes to matters of faith and morality. Faith alone, human beings are saved by faith through grace, not by works. And the third tenet, the priesthood of all believers. 
The laity ought to have access, he said, to the scriptures in their own vernacular and should no longer require priests or pastors to be mediators between God and humanity, which requires the mention of two lesser known tenets, Christ alone, Christ, not any priest or pastor is the sole mediator between God and humankind and grace alone, God's free unmerited favor. A few of you may be surprised to learn that the term Protestant is not derived from Luther's 95 Theses on October 31st, 1517, but rather April 19th, 1529, some 12 years later, when several princes and representatives petitioned or protested the imperial ban against Luther uh, and his teachings. While Methodism is widely regarded as Protestant, its origin is not directly connected to either Luther or the theses or the petition, but rather to the Anglican Church, more specifically the Church of England, which traces its history back to 1534 when King Henry VIII renounced papal authority because the Pope refused to grant an annulment of his marriage to Catherine of Aragon, Mary Anne Boleyn. Henry made himself the supreme head of the Church of England and was subsequently excommunicated by Pope Paul III. And I know a couple of you are saying, Martha, wake me up when he's finished. <laughs> but there might be a couple of you who can appreciate a little historical context. All right, fast forward, to <laughs> fast forward two centuries and you have the births of John and Charles Wesley in Methodism. John Wesley was born June 28, 1703 to Father Samuel, who was a poet and rector of Epworth, and Mother Susanna, who was the youngest of 25 children. All right, there we go. I know, right? She herself bore 19 children, nine of which lived beyond infancy. He, had, he attended, I'm doing my best to make this interesting for you. <laughs> he attended Oxford, was ordained a deacon in 1725, priest in 1726, journeyed to Georgia as a missionary, importantly during his travels to and from Georgia. As some of you know, a great storm arose and it broke the mast of the ship. And the story goes that in the midst of all of that chaos, the English panicked, but the Moravians prayed and sang hymns. Moravians were German pietists from Reformed and Lutheran churches. That's an important Methodist connection. For all of his education and training as a priest, Wesley felt that the Moravians these German pietists from Lutheran churches possessed something he did not, which eventually led him to a Moravian meeting on Aldersgate Street when on May 24, 1738, he heard a reading of Martin Luther's preface to the Epistle to the Romans, and he would feel his heart strangely warm. In 1741, Wesley preached a sermon at Oxford University titled, The Almost Christian, a sermon which was reprinted no less than 25 times during his lifetime and has been the second piece in every published edition of his collected sermons. Luke Powery writes, Jesus doesn't want us to be the almost Christian but what Wesley called the altogether Christian. The almost Christian is sincere and does nothing the gospel forbids. They are those who have a form of godliness yet deny its power. But the altogether Christian includes the love of God and the love of neighbor and faith that works by love. 
The altogether Christian is such that the love of God and love of neighbor converge into one love. Powery continues, Jesus doesn't want any half-baked, half-baptized Christians. The church, Wesley said, is full of Christians who have not gone all the way with Christ. It's form without substance. It's liturgy without the liturgy after the liturgy, meaning it's the work of the people. That's what liturgy means. The work of the people without loving God and loving others outside the walls of the church. He says we wouldn't want to be or go to an almost doctor or an almost lawyer. So why settle for an almost Christian. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now for many people, loving God can seem abstract and loving our neighbor can seem overwhelming when we consider, according to Jesus, in a spiritual sense, no one is beyond the bounds of care and concern. So where do we start? Where do we start? The best preparation for loving the world at large, John Henry Newman once preached, is to cultivate an intimate friendship and affection toward those who are immediately about us. That's you and me. Meet Lucy Carlson writes Peter Marty. Lucy Carlson is a five-year-old in my congregation who is starting with her neighborhood. In her household, honest conversations about current events is a regular occurrence. When national anger followed the death of George Floyd, Lucy was coloring on her front porch one morning. She said to her mom, I think it's important to know our neighbors and I'm going to meet them all. And if they need help, I want them to know where I live so they can come to me for help. I'm going to have them sign my paper so I know their name, she says, just not in cursive. <laughs> the next day, carrying an enormous piece of paper and a pouch full of Crayola markers, Lucy and her mom headed to the first house. The family was cleaning out the garage when Lucy stepped up confidently. Hi, I'm Lucy and this is my mom, Erin. We live across the street and I think it's important to know your neighbors. So I want you to sign my paper and you can come to my house if you need help and I'll help you. Smiling, each family member took a marker and wrote their name. Nobody at the second house answered the door, so Lucy wrote down the address so she could remember to follow up later. At the third house, well, the moms got to talking and carrying on. With some imp impatience, Lucy pulled out her, her phone out of her pocket and started, you know, typing away a phone number. Before long, she said, Mom, don't you think it's time we get on to the next house? And the neighbor asked what she was typing on, and she said, it's my phone. But of course, it wasn't a real phone. It was actually a, a fan remote control <laughs> that she was using as a phone. The women laughed, and off went Lucy and her mother to the next house. Lucy spent more summer days going from house to house, and she'd bring her poster-sized paper and pouch of markers and her customary spiel along with her. After introducing herself and telling the homeowner where she'd lived, she'd say, I think it's important to know your neighbors, so I want you to sign this. She handed them the paper adorned with rainbows and, you know, smiley faces. She made sure to point out her two glitter markers, would also say, you can pick whatever color marker you want. Erin 
spoke to me of being slightly embarrassed during these walks, Peter Marty says. You know, the mom was feeling a little embarrassed. We lived in our house for seven years, and I didn't know the majority of people nearby. From her neighborhood journeys, Lucy learned to make jam. Multiple neighbors offered their teenagers for babysitting. A retired music teacher let her play the, the harp. Lucy showed off her yoga poses. She met a woman from China. And then Jacob Blake was shot. Lucy's response, Mom, I think we need to go meet some more neighbors. Martin Luther was right, I think, when he said, God does not need our good works, but our neighbors do. God does not need our good works, but our neighbors do. I used to believe in the American dream, writes Eve Birch, which meant a job and a mortgage cable TV and credit cards, warranties and success. I wanted it and I worked toward it like everyone else, all of us separately chasing the same thing. One year, through a season of unhappy events, it all just fell apart. I found myself homeless and alone. I had my truck in $56. I scoured the countryside for some place I could rent for the cheapest possible amount. I came upon a shack in an isolated hollow four miles up a winding road over the Potomac River in West Virginia. It was abandoned. It had been abandoned for a long time, full of broken glass and rubbish. When I pried off the plywood over the window and climbed in through the window, I found something I could put my hands to, she says. I hadn't been alone for 25 years. I was scared, but I hoped the hard work would distract me and heal me. I found the owner and rented the place for $50 a month. I took a bedroll, a broom, a rope, a gun, and some cooking gear. And I cleared a, a corner to camp in while I worked. The locals knew nothing about me, she says. But slowly, they started teaching me the art of being a neighbor. They dropped off blankets, candles, tools, canned deer meat, and they began sticking around to chat. They asked if I wanted to go meet Cousin Albie or go fishing or maybe have some drinks some night. They started to teach me a belief in a different American dream, not one of individual achievement, but one of neighborliness. Men would stop by with wild berries ice cream, truck parts, and bullets to see if I was up for courting. You bet they did. <laughs> I wasn't, but they were civil anyway. The women on that mountain worked harder than any I'd ever met, and they taught me how to use a whetstone to sharpen my knives, and how to store food in the creek, and how to keep it cold and safe. I learned to keep enough food for an extra plate for company. What I had believed in, all those things I thought were the necessary accoutrements for civil, civilized life were non-existent in this place. Up on that mountain, my most valuable possessions were my relationships with my neighbors. After four years in that hollow, I moved back into town. And I saw a lot of people were having a really hard time losing their jobs and their homes. 
With the help of a real estate broker, I chatted up at the grocery store. I managed to rent a big enough house to take in a handful of people. There are four of us now in that house, but over time, I've had nine people come in and move on to other places from here. We'd all be in shelters if we hadn't banded together. The American dream I believe in now is a shared one. It's not so much about what I can get for myself. It's about how we can all get by together. Friends, on this Reformation Sunday, let us give thanks for Martin Luther, who said, a true Christian lives and labors on earth not for himself, but for his neighbor. Therefore, the whole spirit of his life impels him to do even that which he needs not to do, but which is profitable and necessary for his neighbor. This is faith working itself in love. Unlike the almost Christian, this is the altogether Christian, John West, as John Wesley puts it, where love of God and love of neighbor converge into one love. So let us do our part. Love God. Love your neighbor. Let us give thanks for Lucy Carlson. Let us take a, a page out of her book with her poster-sized paper and pouch of Crayola markers, whose message is simply, you can come to my house if you need help and I'll help you. Because at seven years old, Lucy knows what Eve Birch and her neighbors know, and maybe what you and I know too. It's not so much about what you or I can get for ourselves. It's about how we can all get by together. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. So please stand.
reminder to um, please be sure to go to the social hall and sign the, um, the poster signs for the, the two Methodist churches before leaving today. And um, those of you who are super excited to, to serve on trustees and finance, <laughs> be sure to talk to me after the service. <laughs> before you were born, God knew you. You're not an accident, although those may occur, and you're not a mistake. Although you and I make them, you are fearfully and wonderfully made, beloved and blessed by God. Go now into the world and offer it your blessing. Go knowing no matter where you go or where I go, all the ground between us and before us is holy ground. Go now in peace. Amen. If you would like to, we're going to sing another song, and anyone that wants to stay, please stay and sing with us. It's a tongue twister.
rain when you speak life with the words you say. Raise your thoughts a little higher. Use your words to inspire. Joy will fall like rain when you speak life with the things you say. Lift your head a little higher. Spread the love like fire. Hope will fall like rain when you speak life with the words you say. Speak life, speak life to the deadest dark.